All right, we're going up so you can see me. Uh, I'm just so delighted to see all of you out here. Um, and I hope I get to meet each one of you and chat with you. Uh, and it's the first day. So just I just want you to just take a moment. Take a deep breath in and out. It's been a long day. Some of you uh, traveled through crazy conditions, all sorts of things. Um, but I'm just so glad you're here. And I'm delighted to be able to teach this week. I'm delighted to be able to teach in 1 Peter. I am a person who's fairly passionate about 1 Peter. Many years ago, I memorized the book of 1 Peter. Yes, the whole book. Um, and I'm now trying to review it because I've forgotten it. Uh, so you can challenge me at any point and ask me to start trying to say it to you. Um, and then I'm really excited too, because not just 1 Peter, but our theme this week, our spiritual theme, is growing in grace. And I have been on a journey in my life, uh, growing to understand the expansiveness of God's grace for us. And so I'm just so delighted that this is what we get to focus on this week. Uh, but let me quickly, uh, I'm realizing I'm already off track, uh, already off. Okay, so this is my family. Just wanted to briefly introduce uh, my family to you. This is taken uh, in December when our daughter got married. So. Uh, there's my lovely husband. He's in the back. Uh, you'll see him this week. Uh, and then this next guy next to me, that's my new son-in-law, Michael, who I love, uh, who married my daughter, Casey. And we're actually really celebrating their wedding in just a little bit in May. So it's kind of nuts. Uh, this is my Claire. Yes, she looks exactly like me. And that's our big James, who many of you actually went to church with. So you know him. Uh, so yeah, that's a little bit about my family. So... Prior to uh, coming to Canada, Chad and I had an assignment. Uh, it was uh, a life map of sorts. Um, and a life, a life map helps you think about your life, the experiences you've had, uh, what you learned, what God was doing. And that was part of our assignment to come to Canada. We had to first do a life mat, map. And I'm just going to show you a little bit about my life and how God has transformed me. Um, and so, are we good? Okay, there we go. Uh, this is gonna be tricky, me not seeing it. So you guys might get annoyed with me doing this, but okay, you can tell me if it's ever not the right, uh, the right slide. So you can see in my childhood, the way that I saw myself was vulnerable, and then wounded, uh, then in my teen years, I saw myself as saved. Then I saw myself as restored, yet ashamed. I had a lot of things I was holding on to. Then I adopted a mantra, and the mantra was, I will be perfect. And we'll talk about that a little bit this week. And then I realized, I am so angry. I am so, so angry. And it was spilling out all over the place. And then God did some things. And I realized I was acceptable. But I didn't only realize I was acceptable. I realized that I was delighted in. And that was huge. But then I didn't only realize that I was delighted in. I realized that I was beloved. And I finally realized that I can be Kathleen. I can be Kathleen. And it was quite a journey, my friends. I want you to notice what I believed about myself, even into my 30s, you might notice that there's a little uh, phrase that says, I don't deserve grace. And that's how I felt. And why would I write that? Why would I write that I don't deserve grace? I wrote that because I believed that the worst thing I had ever done, in my estimation, and the angry ways that I continued to live while being a Christ follower made me realize I just don't deserve grace. And I don't know, um, I don't know about you. I don't know from your perspective, what's the worst thing that you've ever done? I don't know what that is for each one of you. Or how are you continuing to struggle? How are you continuing to struggle right now? And how does that make you feel about grace? Do you deserve grace? Well, here's the truth. None of us 
deserve grace, right? But who is our father? Is he gracious to those who deserve it? I'm never going to forget the day I remember where I was sitting when I told God, don't be gracious to me. I don't deserve it. Stop it. Yes, buckle up buttercup because they asked me to speak and I cry when I speak. And I especially cry when I talk about what the Father has done in me. I'm not crying because I'm sad now. I am crying because there was a deep movement of God in my life and it changed me. So I'll never forget when I told God that he should not be gracious to me. He said, girl, I get to decide who I'm gracious to. And I have sent my son to the cross because I want to be gracious to you. I want that for you. You know what I suppose I learned that day? I suppose I learned that I was a daughter worth loving. I was a daughter worth loving. And I think some of you here need to hear that you are a son worth loving loving, no matter what you've done, no matter what you're doing now, no matter where you've been, but you are a son worth loving. And I believe some of you are daughters worth loving, and you need to hear that. Jesus, his grace, it's the best gift that all of us have ever received, that we would be worth loving. Well, tonight, we're going to do two things. Uh, to set us up for our mornings in 1 Peter. We're going to set the context for 1 Peter, so we have a sense of uh, what's happening in this book. And then we're going to ask, what is grace, and what does it mean to grow in grace? Uh, and so before we uh, dive in too far, I just want you to look at this lovely word map uh, and just see the words on this word map. This is where we're headed. You see suffering, you see insult. Got to go back, go back. Right here? Great. Um, awesome. Yeah, look at this. This is where we're headed in 1 Peter this week. It's going to be fantastic. Okay, let me read for us 1 Peter 1, 1 to 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Okay, so Peter is writing First Peter. Makes that easy. And we're just going to talk through a little bit about who is this Peter that's writing this letter. Peter reminds us that he was an eyewitness of the grandeur of Jesus' transfiguration. Uh, remember the mountain where Peter tries to set up tents uh, for Jesus and Moses and Elijah? Uh, Peter is one of Jesus' besties, okay? A moment later, Peter is scared out of his wits when the Father speaks. And when Jesus looks at Peter, he says, let's call you rock. Hmm. I want to talk about the number three. Either Peter's a bit slow or a bit stubborn, okay? We might as well call him three times Peter. Because uh, he's the fisherman that denied Christ three times, thank you. Uh, three times, Jesus says, do you love me? Three times, he sees a vision uh, to eat what God has made clean. Three men, we're way ahead of those, we don't need that. Three men search for him uh, to bring him to Cornelius. It's that story which... Peter learned something very important, that God doesn't show favoritism, which he actually needed to learn that lesson to be able to write this book. Uh, and so if you are the type who doesn't get it the first time, you're in great company. Uh, thank you, Peter, for, uh, for modeling that for us. Okay, what else? He was married. Can I go there now? Yeah, there we go. He's married. Uh, he's a healer. He literally prayed for Tabitha, and she rose from the dead. You know, it wasn't just Jesus who rose people from the dead. P 
Peter literally prayed and Tabitha rose from the dead. And it wasn't just Tabby. There were people who were literally putting, putting themselves anywhere they thought that Peter's shadow would fall so that they would be healed. And it says that all were healed. So Peter, whoa, he's like healing pe people in the power of the Spirit of God. He experienced God's power. I don't know if you remember this. He was, he was the one who had a jailbreak by an angel and he was rescued from Herod. That's Acts 12. And he's an author. And in this book, Peter's writing from Babylon, which is the code name for Rome. Peter was beaten up for his faith. And he writes 1 Peter shortly before he's martyred for his faith under Nero's persecution. Here we go. <laughs> this is the Peter we get to learn from. Whoa. It's pretty good stuff. Okay. So let's take a moment and look at what is happening around the time that this letter was written. Uh, you can see uh, 1 Peter is written about 30 years after Jesus rose from the dead. And I just want you to notice as well the emperors, the bottom line. You see that there's Claudius, and then you see that there's Nero. Does anybody know anything about Nero? Anybody ever heard anything about Nero? Thumbs down if he's kind of a bad dude. He's a bad dude. Yes, bad dude. Okay, so that's what's happening. That's who's in power when 1 Peter is written. At least that's what um, I think most scholars would say. So it's a dangerous time and place in the world to be a Christian. People are being persecuted for their faith. And Peter will soon be martyred. He will give his life. Somebody will take his life because of his faith. So who is Peter writing to? This is key to understanding any book in the Bible. It doesn't say, uh, dear Canadians, right? The Bible was not written to us, but for us. The Bible was not written to us, but it was written for us. Uh, and Peter's writing to these people. So there's some familiarity uh, between Peter and these readers of this letter because he also refers to them as beloved. In this intro, intro and throughout, Peter refers to them foreigners and exiles. And exiles is a common theme throughout all of scripture in the Old Testament, particularly. And we'll be learning more about that. Uh, but likely, Peter is writing to some who are Jewish and some who are Gentile. I think that'd be fun for you as you're reading this book to think, huh, does this sound like something he would say to a Jewish reader or a Gentile reader? They were living in cities and in rural areas. And they were in these five colonies. First, let me show you, is this modern day Turkey? Yes, it is. So they, they were what is now considered modern day Turkey. But now you can see these are the five colonies that Peter writes to, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these five colonies all had something in common. They were established by Emperor Claudius, and they were populated by deportations from Rome and other major cities. Believers were being persecuted by Claudius, and so they fled to these colonies. And this right here, it's roughly the size of the state of California. So that's, that just gives you a feel for how big it is. And Peter's writing to these believers to encourage them to remember who they are and how they're to conduct themselves in a hostile culture where they're facing rejection and they're facing persecution. The believers are suffering. And so you will see, and you probably already know, that suffering is a major theme in this book. Now, how does this context connect with our context today? We're not being persecuted in Canada. And what I mean by this is, Last I've heard, none of us are at risk for gathering here tonight. Nobody's going to come in and behead us. Um, we're not being tortured for our faith. Uh, in this country, we're more protected than we are persecuted, right? Perhaps, though, we experience a ridicule or insult or um, we're the butt of a joke um, as believers. Maybe we're not so popular but we're not experiencing severe harm, right? But the worldwide church is undergoing severe persecution all over the world. We'll talk a little bit more about that too. 
As followers of Jesus, no matter where we live, our belief systems are at odds with those around us. We're not home. And so this makes us a lot like foreigners, just like these readers are too. So we're going to turn to 1 Peter 5 for the purpose statement of the book. And I will read it to you, 1 Peter 5, 12 to 14. I've written this briefly and am sending it to you with Silvanus, whom I regard as a faithful brother. My main point is to urge and bear witness to you that this grace in which you stand is the true grace of God. Your chosen sister in Babylon sends you greetings. So does my son Mark. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All right, let's apply that immediately. Turn to the person next to you. Oh, I'm, I'm teasing. You don't even get the joke. Did you get the joke? Come on. Okay, so this is obviously common to kiss with a whole, you know, holy kiss. You guys are, you know, not, that's not that funny. Okay, great. We're not doing that. Don't kiss. Okay, so the main point in writing is to urge them in grace to testify that the grace of God in which they stand is true. It's legit. It's the real thing. And I love the way N.T. Wright translates uh, 1 Peter, and you'll hear me every once in a while quoting his translation of the Bible. Uh, it's the Bible for everyone, so it'll say BFE on the slides. Uh, but I love what he, he says throughout 1 Peter. He says, it's the true value of your faith. It's your true lives. It's the true grace of God. It's not counterfeit. It didn't spring up out of nowhere like a trend that's just coming and going. <laughs> Rather, it's the God of promise, our Father, uh, the Creator, who's the beginning and the end. This is our firm foundation uh, for grace. That's who Jesus is attached to. Um, and it's based on the resurrection, right, of Jesus. And believers, believers are dying for this faith. Believers believe what happened, and they are willing to die for their faith. It's still happening. People are still dying for their faith. In Tim Keller's book, Counterfeit Gods, he writes about the grace of God like a glorious thread that holds God's word together. This is what he says. We usually read the Bible as a series of disconnected stories, each with a moral for how we should live our lives. It is not. Rather, it comprises a single story telling us how the human race got into its present condition and how God through Jesus Christ has come and will come to put things right. In other words, the Bible doesn't give us a God at the top of a moral ladder saying, if you try hard to sum it up your strength and live right, you can make it up. Instead, I don't think Tim Keller says it like that. Okay. Instead, the Bible repeatedly shows us weak people who don't deserve God's grace. They don't seek it. And they don't appreciate it even after they've received it. This is the great biblical story arc into which every individual scripture narrative fits. Can we trust grace? Can we stand on it? Is it secure? Certainly in a world where you expect that torture or death may be the result of proclaiming your faith, you might be tempted to ask, is this really worth it? Do I really believe this? Will I truly experience the grace of God for eternity? And Peter urges them to keep on standing in God's grace, confident that they will receive what God has promised through Christ. So what's, what is God's grace? I'm going to borrow from Ephesians. Ephesians talks about God demonstrating his extraordinary riches of grace. Paul speaks of grace as every blessing that we receive in Christ, that he freely gives us uh, through, the son, through the son that he loves, in the son that he loves. By grace, we've been rescued, not when we were on our best behavior, but when we were living our lives according to our own preferences our sinful desires without reference to God. And I like how John Golden Gay, he's a leading scholar, highlights these thoughts about grace uh, from a language lens. And he pulls out uh, hen, hen, excuse me, hen, which is the Old Testament word. I know I've got some in here who actually know these things. Okay, there's hen, uh, which is the Old Testament word translated grace. 
And that is a gift that is given in delight, and it suggests something more occasional that is shown um, by a superior to an inferior. Well, then there's hasid, which is an Old Testament word that's used to describe love. This unconditional love, this generosity, and hasid suggests ongoing commitment. It's the steady thing. Well, then you have the New Testament Greek word for grace, and that's charis. And charis is a gracious gift. And charis combines the, these Hebrew ideas of hen and hesed. Uh, Golden Gate says that charis is arguably another equivalent to the Old Testament word for commitment. So when we think of grace, we can think of it as God's commitment to us expressed in unconditional love and generosity. Grace is the very essence of the being of God. It's the very essence of the being of God. God shows more hen than anyone. It's what he does. Grace is very reliable and it's a consistent character trait of God. Grace is the givingness of God. You'll hear me say that again. again. It's the givingness of God that he can't help but share. And God's determination to stay in a relationship with people who continually betray him, <laughs> that's what defines our relationship with God as grace. It's unmerited favor that God looks on you favorably and treats you kindly in spite of your inability to earn his blessing. It is grace that saves us. Grace reminds us that we cannot make it on our own. Everything in the life of a follower is based on grace. I like the way my friend Sion describes grace. She says, it's the vastness of God who loves us, accepts us, brings us into his fold, without an ounce of our contribution. And I like to picture God's grace using the imagery given in the blessing that we're all familiar with. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. When you picture God, how do you picture him? Is his face looking toward you with a glow of joy and delight? Is it disappointed? How does his face look? This week will be mostly in 1 Peter, but our theme for this week is actually taken from the last verse of 2 Peter. And 2 Peter is like a sequel to the first letter. So, you know, uh, it's, so it reads these last two, these la I'll read the last two verses. 2 Peter 3, 17 to 18. But as for you, my dear family, be on your guard since you've been warned in advance. That way you won't be led astray through the error of lawless people and fall away from your own solid grounding. Instead, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Messiah. To him be glory both now and in the day when God's new age dawns. Amen. So this is grace. What does it mean to grow in grace? And the Basecamp content prep team, thank you, you're out there, had several conversations about this. How does one grow in grace? Well, I want us uh, to think about at least a couple ways we might go wrong in trying to understand this. We're going to call this two bad news traps, or if you know me well, two bad news bears traps. So we might think growing at, in grace, um, that God becomes more gracious to me, um, that I can somehow earn my grace by good behavior. And I'm calling that the performance trap. We wonder if, there, if there's something we must do in order for God to be more gracious, more kind to us. No, that would be the opposite, right, of how grace works. We can't earn grace. When someone hands you a gift, you don't hand them a $50 bill, right? That would be insulting. That's not grace. 
So growing in grace does not mean obeying to earn more grace. And I'm going to just show you briefly a slide that talks a little bit about if you're if we primarily relate to God with a behavior focus lens and some of my UBC friends, yay, you get to see it again. So uh, what on the left side, what motivates us? If, if, our, if our primary way we relate to God is through a behavior focus lens, well then what might motivate us is behaving well, pleasing God and behaving well. Why? To feel good about ourselves. <laughs> It's really about ourselves. It's about our behavior. And so then this is what happens when our primary motivation is behavior. Uh, when I behave poorly, I feel ashamed in guilt, I confess, repeat. I'll behave well, I don't behave, I feel bad, I feel guilty, and repeat. Now, what did Jesus say to the Pharisees and teachers of the law? In Matthew 15, he said, your hearts are far from God. Your hearts are far from God. Why? Because they were focused on externals. They were focused on behavior. They were focused on what they did and say, said. They were thinking that they would be pleasing to God when they behaved well. So the question Tim Keller always asks, and I love this, he says, is the gospel primarily good news? Is it something that happened? It's an event, a historical event that happened, and so it's good news, or is it good advice? I wonder what we all believe about that. And here's what I've learned and seen and witnessed again and again in my own life and in those around me, that when this is the lens we're living with, when it's all about how well we can perform and behave for God, the pressure to, to live a double life, the pressure to perform, create conditions for living a double life. We just can't manage it. We're never going to behave well enough. So that we will we'll tomorrow, I think, or maybe two days, in two days we'll talk more about a different sort of lens. But that is one lens. The second trap. Growing in grace means I focus more and more on grace and less and less on God's commands, his truth, or his holiness. And my behavior doesn't matter at all. <laughs> it just doesn't matter. This is called the antinomianism trap, which is a big word. But it's basically just saying you have just gone completely to grace, and you just are completely disregarding God's word. You know what? Both of those have to do with behavior. Both of those have to do with ourselves. <clears throat> So that is not what growing in grace means. <laughs> um, because here's a, here's a scoop. That is not grace because it disgraces the one who gives us grace. If it disgraces the one who gives us grace, it is not grace. So we'll see that the grace we receive sets us up for a new life, which includes participating in the good, creative work of God working with God in the world. And so here's how I want us to think about growing in grace this week. First, let's not separate grace from knowledge. 2 Peter 1, 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 17 tells us that we can be led astray in our understanding about God. And I've experienced that in this life too. I've seen that. We could grow in another direction. And what are, what are other directions we could grow? Let me name a few directions that we can grow as we get older. Thank goodness I'm older, I've, I've seen it all. We can grow in self-reliance. We can grow in self-preoccupation. We can grow in self-inflation. I just wanna get the selfs out there. We can grow in hunger for success. It's all about success. For greed, we hold on to our money and our possessions. It's mine. We can grow on our reliance on what people say or think about us. We can grow in anxiety. We can grow in a direction away from dependence on scriptures as a source of life. We can grow in rule keeping. <laughs> we can grow in bad habits, for sure. 
We can grow in bitterness and complaint. And there are just so many ways we can grow in this life. And so which direction do you want to grow? My Bible study this year, the coolest Bible study ever, latched onto a phrase this year. And this is the phrase, watch yourselves. <laughs> it is in the scriptures. Watch yourselves. <laughs> it just cracks me up. And so I want to say to us, watch the direction of your growth because it matters. It matters. Watch the direction of your growth. Okay, there's an alternative. Beyond these crazy alternatives, all these crazy things that we're growing in that we don't want to grow in, and we all don't want to do that, right? We can grow in knowing our Lord and our Savior. Have you ever noticed uh, which direction a plant grows? What direction? Call it out. What direction does a plant grow? 100%. So if you put a plant somewhere and it's not really getting even sunshine, what's it going to do? It's just going to, it's just going to, it will just, your plant will be like this. And I always have to, turn, I'm turning around my plant all the time because he's like this. And then I go like this. And then he goes like this. The plant just does this, right? Okay. So uh, it takes intentionality to grow. A plant will die without water, without sunlight, without care. And we too need to be intentional about growth. So what does it mean to grow in knowledge? What kind of knowledge? We're to know God in a holistic way, right? Uh, intellectually, we can understand who God is, and we're not to be ignorant. Uh, First Peter and Second Peter says that. And we should pursue this kind of knowledge. We can know about God, but this is not complete knowledge, right? We must know him experientially and relationally as well. We can know him personally. And when you know someone personally, you can either trust or distrust that person. And knowing goes both ways. Knowing relationally goes both ways. It's God knows us, we know him, and we know ourselves through knowing him. And if we lose, I'm just going to say, if we lose that part of knowing ourselves in pursuit of knowing him, it's actually useless knowledge because you can't apply knowledge if you don't know yourself and what's happening in here. So it all has to go together in this relationship we have with God. Perhaps one way to think about knowing God personally, rather than just knowing about him, which we should know about him as well, is to think about knowing someone personally as love. When you're in a relationship with someone who is so, so good, you grow in love. You grow in trust. Peter writes that this kind of knowing, it changes us and it produces fruit. That's what 2 Peter 1, 5 to 11 says. We can't grow in grace without growing and knowing God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, personally, relationally. And we do this through God's word, in prayer, and in community. So let's sum this up. Let's think about growing in grace. Am I on the right slide? Now am I? Oh, yay. Okay, we can think about growing in grace. This is fun. Um, as understanding God's grace towards us and guarding this understanding, that's A. B, being transformed by his grace in various forms. And C, finally becoming more gracious to others because his grace changes us. And we're going to talk through four ways we can grow in grace this week. And we'll think about the means God use, uses to grow us in grace. We're going to look at one each day. We're going to, we'll grow in grace through knowing and trusting our Father, through a new identity in his Son, through sharing in submission and suffering, and through shining as his community. That's where we're headed this week. And it's going to be a great, great week. Challenging too, I think. In closing, I want you to picture with me that God has given us this incredible mansion and we have access to the whole place. Okay, party, let's do this thing. 
massive, massive party. It's huge, it's gargantuan. And he's filled this mansion with the most incredibly glorious, delightful light. Think of sunshine that would never burn your skin, but only bring warmth and brightness. It's a light that heals. It's a light that comforts. It's a beautiful light that soaks into your being in such a way that it radiates from you. Now you've been invited, all of you have been invited into this grand mansion. And you have some choices. You could sit in a corner, perhaps covered with a blankie, <laughs> kind of hide, hide in the mansion. Maybe just a small ray of light is shining on you. Maybe you feel stagnant or afraid or maybe alone. And maybe we are there sometimes, right? Or <laughs> we could explore this mansion. It's filled with light. It's, it's, it, it's a light that touches us so deeply that we can't help but notice the difference that it makes. Growing in grace is the opportunity to embrace all of that mansion in community with one another. Exploring the many rooms and the many spaces, letting God's light soak in us and change us. <laughs> and this week, it's our desire that you rest, that you grow, and that you play. And I'm more convinced um, than ever that growing in grace has everything to do with our ability to rest and to grow and to play. So I want to encourage you, dive into this. Dive into rest. Dive into growing in grace. And dive into playing. And I want to suggest something um, this maybe is just for me. But when I think about rest, and I think about where we're at uh, in this season of life, I want to encourage you to have a little sit-down chat with your beast. Oh, I mean, your cell phone device. Um, maybe set some boundaries. Um, maybe give yourself a little space from your I will interrupt you at every single moment device. Um, because it's really hard, and it seems like research is saying that our cell phones are actually preventing us from being able to rest. They're actually creating more anxiety, not less. And so I already texted my family earlier today and I said, hey, I'm gonna be really busy this week with my friends at base camp and just taking time. I'm gonna check my phone twice a day. So if you need me, uh, know that I'll check you twice a day. Here is Green, here's, uh, I'm at Green Bay Bible Camp. If there's an emergency, you can call them if you can't get a hold of me. Um, and I'm gonna just do my best to kind of just put my phone away for the week. And you can join me or not. Uh, some of you are like, no thanks. Um, but if you want to, um, maybe that would help some of us um, to rest. So this is the beginning of the week. I don't know. Um, I don't know most of you. I don't know what your week's been like, your month, your year, your semester. And I don't know what you're bringing into this week, what burdens you might be carrying. But I know the one who delights to carry burdens and so we're going to take a moment now uh, before we close, and I'm just going to put up a slide for you, and I just want you to sit with the Lord for a moment and think through some of these questions. And then I want to also just, I just want you to know, um, you guys have an awesome opportunity this week to be listened to, to be cared for, to be prayed for. We have staff that will just kind of make themselves available around the back of the room so if at any point you're thinking about something and you're just like, I just want somebody else to pray on this with me, um, just they'll be on the sides of the room and you can just go and pray with them. But we're just going to take a little moment now before we close and I'm going to let you think about a few of these things. We'll be doing uh, some God time or reflection time each day and tonight is just a little bit shorter just because we have friends who have traveled a long distance and we don't want it to be too long. But I'm just going to close um, with this prayer from the open gate. David Adam writes, Lord, help me to relax. Take from me the tension that makes peace impossible. Take from me the fears that do not allow me to venture Take from me the worries that blind my sight. Take from me the distress 
that hides your joy. Help me to know that I am with you, that I'm in your care, that I'm in your love, that you and I are one. Amen.